There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also had descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Appreciated Trevor's prayer uh, and related to uh, his prayer um, and in quoting a certain leader of a country in the Western world, uh, I don't mean to politicize. Uh, I don't mean to um, uh, necessarily declare a certain position. Um, but what I like to do personally is to, all the more for the sake of seeing how much more beautiful Jesus is, uh, to even compare him to uh, earthly leaders, leaders in history. And this past week, um, a certain leader of a uh, country in the Western world talking about commenting on a protest that was unfolding uh, described of those people gathering to protest that they are a fringe minority with unacceptable views. And so, again, to quickly make this about Jesus, um, Jesus is so different. In his day, what he did, what we see in the Gospels, is that he actually went to the fringes. Uh, even the fact that he left heaven and came to earth, that's an act of God himself in the second person of the Trinity, Jesus the Son, leaving all his glory, all his comfort, and coming to the fringes uh, in the cosmos to come to earth and to be found uh, as a helpless babe on earth. And in his adult ministry, he deliberately ministered to those on the fringes, socially, um, medically, spiritually. And so Jesus... He made a way, ultimately, um, with all the work that he did through his life, his death, his resurrection, uh, one of the end goals is, was for him to be able to gather a people together, not only by a democratic majority. In fact, you could say, tongue-in-cheek, that it was a democratic spirit that got him onto the cross uh, at his trial. Uh, but his goal, not, not to to try to bring together by a democratic majority and therefore leave a certain minority in the dust, but to bring the most different people together. Another way to talk about that, and you could just simplify it into one word, unity, unity. Now, unity, it's not just a Christian thing. You look through all history, and unity is a prized possession. One of the most timeless, weighty, measures of legitimacy for any nation, any empire, any family, any marriage, any friendship, from the grandest, biggest things down to the smallest everyday little things is this thing called unity, to be one, oneness. And so the adage that reveals the otherwise uh, opposite of unity lives to this day, divide and conquer, right? Divide and conquer, it works. It works. And the only thing that's good, and at least in our host, household, that's good to divide and conquer is the grocery list. Uh, otherwise, dividing and conquering, uh, it works. It, it, it destroys. So that's the flip side of, of unity. Now, we shouldn't be surprised because we believe in God who created this universe and he um, stamped his image on everything. And first, so on that grandest eternal cosmic scale, God is, is beautifully mysterious. He is three in one. He is 
diversity in unity. He's three individual persons in unity, in one. On a national level, we don't have to go far to see that the strongest nations and empires, when they were strongest, because it's because they were unified. They were one. And when they became weakest, it's because they were divided and conquered. At a family level, when you see a family that's unified, a husband and wife that's unified, it's good. And so a synonym for unity could be wholeness, oneness. And so just to make it more familiar, hopefully this idea of unity then becomes familiar to you, is familiar. So today, these verses, verses 4 to 10, and, and we will skip back to verse 3 for a little bit, um, I want to talk about the church's oneness, and in the letter, it's, it's the second time that Paul addresses it. Uh, and I hope you catch the drift with me that oneness in God's plan for his church, his unity, the wholeness of, of the church is so important, worth fighting for. And so a, a prayer that I have for all of us, I, I hope, and just sort of as a focal point of, of the passage I hope that as we work through this passage that something will be stirred up in your heart to want to talk to God uh, in prayer, in intimate prayer, by faith. Lord, make me eager. Make me eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Make me eager to fight for oneness within the church uh, that is, is, is wrought by the Holy Spirit with this bond of peace. So I want to ask three questions today. First, why? Why should I be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit? I think Paul delves into that. Second, how? How do I maintain very practically uh, the unity of the Spirit? And third, who ultimately? Who ultimately maintains the unity of the Spirit? So first question to get our thoughts rolling. Why should I be eager to maintain unity of the Spirit? And so Paul, uh, going back to verse 3, first of all, he says, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And this word eager, it has the notion of, uh, it's very emphatic. Uh, it carries the notion, we're to spare no effort. That's what eager is meant to communicate. That's what we're supposed to think and feel as we read this, that, that we're to spare no effort to have a continuous, diligent activity to continue to pursue this unity and to maintain it, to grow it, to nourish it. It's not a being quiet and wait and see attitude, but being intentional and, and taking initiative. And if unity is being uh, hindered or, or threatened, that we really make the effort to overcome whatever difference and come together and maintain and preserve that unity. Now Paul, then, he gives us other reasons. We're asking why. Why should we be eager? Because he explains there is one body. And so here's this beautiful, mysterious metaphor of Christianity. That Jesus is the head, and we're to think of a human body. And, and, and so how unnatural is it? I mean, horror movies are, and stories are made of the headless horseman, and so forth, right? How unnatural is it for a body to not have a head? And so thinking of this imagery of a body, Jesus is the head. He's the, the center. He's the one that is driving the, the purpose, the decisions, the heart, the emotions. And then he has a body. And the Bible explains beautifully that the church, all those people who place faith in Christ are his body. So the first reason here is because there's an anatomy to the church. Uh, we're, we're, meant, we're not meant to be a, a headless uh, horseman. And Jesus is not just to meant, meant to just be a head, a decapitated head. Now, I don't apologize using that kind of gruesome language because that's the point. That's how important our unity is, that we really are Christ's body and one with him and one with each other. Now, the, the second reason that uh, we see here, I'm sorry, Paul, in, in elaborating on that, says there's one body and one spirit, meaning 
Um, just as with a human body, if one part of your body is, is severed, then, then your life will flow out, right? And, and you could actually pass away because life is flowing out of you. And so in the same way, similarly, this is how much Paul wants us to understand how important it is that we are part of Christ's body and that our identity is found in this communal aspect of being Christ's body and being one with each other. And this Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, it flows through His body. And so you and I, just as our physical bodies are wonderfully uh, just mysteriously, just a, a feat of human biological engineering. It, it flows, it works, it lives because there's a oneness to even the parts of our physical body. Even more importantly, the same Holy Spirit is flowing and, and living in all of us and binding us together. So the point is, just, just as, as it's un, as unnatural as it is to think of uh, a body whose members are dismembered, That's the same importance of the church being one. Now, notice the the second reason, and uh, this is really neat. This is the first time I noticed this in my own read of Ephesians. Uh, Just as you were called to the one hope, and here's the part that I want you to notice, that belongs to your call. Why should we be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit? Because this is baked into unity of the Spirit and of of the church being one is baked into the definition of being a Christ follower. The one hope that belongs to your call. When you said yes to Jesus, uh, whether this was explicitly explained to you or not, whether you were aware of it or not, what came baked into the call, kind of like the fine print when you sign something, but it's not fine print really. It should be something that is explained in big, bold font when we are invited to place faith in Christ. Baked into our call, and this call is referring to a call to respond to God's grace. It's specifically, it's not a vocational call. It's not a call to a certain cause uh, on earth, but it's a call to become a child of God by grace through faith. And what belongs to your call is that you're not just saved individually, but you're saved into the family of Christ, into the body of Christ. That's a definition of a true Christ follower then. That you're saved by grace through faith, called to be God's elect child, God's chosen people, to be adopted and taken to take on the Father God's name and be brought into His family. Okay. Now this makes complete sense because as Christians... We're just overflowing what God has done, who God is, and what He's done for us. And who God is, is that He's the Trinity God. He he is family before any human family existed on earth. And God, being uh, unified, three persons in one, now that overflows into His church. And so we shouldn't be surprised that this is a part of our call. So I love what John Stott says. Reflecting on uh, this part of the passage, is there only one God? Then He has only one church. Is the unity of God inviolable? Then so is the unity of the church. The unity of the church is as indestructible as the unity of God Himself. It is no more possible to be split, sorry, to split the church than it is possible to split the Godhead. Now, what this is getting at, and if you've grown up in the church, then you've probably, sadly, experienced or maybe heard of church splits. And so this, this isn't addressing that experience, because that does happen. That does happen. But what needs to be questioned there is, when there's a split like that, were there true Christians involved in the first place? There should be no difference amongst God's people that can't be overcome by the grace of God and reconciling as God has reconciled us to Himself and applying that to one another. John thought what he's trying to get at, and I agree with him, is, is this is how important unity for the church is meant to be because it reflects the very nature of God. So then how? 
How do I maintain unity of the Spirit? So let's go back to verse 3 again. And Paul, uh, he says, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And here he gives some of the how. In the bond of peace. Now, when I think of bond, and and we should think of it this way, uh, I think of glue, right? Bonding and sealing. And so what Paul is talking about here, to paraphrase it, he's saying eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the glue of peace. What's going to hold us together is this notion of peace. Now the actual language uh, in the Greek, it it literally means ligament. And so kind of same idea. How is your body held together, your physical body? It's, It's held together by all the sinews and ligaments and it's kind of a glue for the body. And so just that whole notion, okay, there's something that's supposed to be sticking us together and making us inseparable. And this bond of peace then, the peace that he's talking about, is the peace that God has purchased himself by his own sacrifice for us. That's the glue. That's the glue. Think of just a a relationship in your life, your story, and there was enough goodness there, enough grace, enough humility that you were able to overcome differences and actually get closer together. You were able to forgive one another, say your, your sincere sorries and to acknowledge one another, and you actually became closer together. See, that, that's, that's the, the, the strength of peace. That's the glue, the, just the bonding power of peace. Now, the strongest relational glue then, so to speak, is the peace that that God has afforded and just applied to his relationship with us. And if we can stay in that, if we can continue to overflow that and apply that in our own relationships, that's what Paul is getting at here. That's how the spirit and the unity of, of the Holy Spirit it's going to be held together. It's, it's if you stay, not by your own human strength and interpersonal skills and diplomatic skills and, and way with words and, and so forth, but what's going to actually hold you together as the church of Christ and where it matters most in eternity is that we continue to overflow this glue of peace that God has applied to us. That's, that's going to be our, our um, just... Uh, Limitless source, limitless well, a well that can't dry up of ability to continue to pursue one another and to seek to be at peace with one another. It's remembering how God is related to us. If we take God out of the picture, I guarantee every one of us is going to run dry at some point and lose the motivation to want to keep reconciling with one another. But if you stay right there, in that good spot of just continually remembering that God, how He has dealt with us, the peace that He's purchased for us through His Son. It's only a hard heart, a cold heart, that will say, no, I don't care how much you have loved me, God, and made peace with me, I'm not going to try to extend that and work that out with this person. And so all the more in the church, we're meant to, Pursue this. We're meant to live this out. Now here's another how then. Because let's be realistic. Even the most quote-unquote godliest of Christians, those who are just, you know, we, we look up to, we respect. Even the godliest Christian on earth, they're, they're not perfect. They're not Jesus. But even the godliest person has a bad day, has trouble, or, or you'll come to differences So Paul, I think what, probably in his mind, foreseeing that, I think what he now lists here, and this is how I I would offer it to you, how do we maintain uh, unity in the Spirit, this bond of peace? We're to come together on the majors. Practically speaking, that's the only way we're going to continue to stay one. Even in Trinity Grace Church, there is, I'll call it a beautiful spectrum of sound theology, right? Within that healthy bandwidth of of orthodox theology, there is a spectrum, and there are differences. 
But what Paul is getting at here, I, I think, I hope you'll agree with me that th- these are majors of the Christian faith that Paul is asking us to be one on. One Lord. As long as we keep Jesus as central and in front of us and that we're all equally coming before Him as sinners in need of grace and who have received grace. And we continue to keep Him preeminent. We continue to look to Him as our head and His Word that we wrestle together with even though we might come at it from different angles and initially what seems like different understandings. That, but as long as He's the one that's bringing us together. One faith. And what this means for Paul is how you come to Christ. Uh, it, it's the whole notion that we are saved by grace. It doesn't matter how different within that healthy bandwidth of orthodox theology, for me, let's say, just to speak uh, just from my own, where I'm standing these days, no matter how charismatic, for example, a brother or sister might be, if they believe in Jesus, and then they uh, believe that they need grace to be saved, and their only part is to confess by faith, to place their faith in Christ, then we're one body. One baptism. What's the major that Paul is referring to here? It's not the mode. Okay, By mode we mean, uh, let's say, believer's baptism or water over the head sprinkled or dunked into a pool or a lake. That's the mode. What he's talking about here is our greatest need. What baptism, you boil it down, what baptism most importantly signifies, the whole notion of it is a cleansing. Whether it's sprinkled, whether it's dunked, whether it's in a shower, whatever, right? The whole notion is a cleansing. It's being washed over. And so what baptism points to, what, what we all have in common, no matter what mode of baptism you've experienced, is that we're, we need cleansing from our sins and pointing to the most important baptism, the baptism of the Spirit that is explained in the New Testament, meaning to be filled with the Spirit, to be reborn from the inside, to be given a new heart. That's the one baptism. And so, if someone is willing to say, my greatest need is for forgiveness of my sins, and it comes with a cleansing by the Spirit on my heart through Jesus and being united to His baptism, meaning... Jesus, he got baptized too to symbolize his death going under in the Jordan water, the river, and being raised to life. And that's a second most important meaning of baptism, that we're united to Christ and his baptism, his death, and his resurrection. Okay? And so here are majors that we're supposed to come on or come around together with. And of course, verse 6, one God and Father of all. But there is one God who has created this universe. So how do we, practically speaking, maintain unity in the Spirit? We're to come together on these majors. And then with much charity, within that orthodox bandwidth of of theology and understanding uh, of Scripture, to discuss our differences and to work these things out. So let me ask the third and last question today then. Who ultimately maintains unity of the Spirit? Whose whose responsibility is it ultimately? This is kind of a both and uh, question and answer. Because Paul, he starts off saying, but, so up to this point, verses 4 to 6, he's been talking from a high level about the church as one whole unit, one whole body of all its many members. And then he pivots. He says, but grace was given to each one of us. It's that whole uh, adage, the, the wisdom of the forest and the trees. Verses 4-6, to six, he was talking about the forest of the church. All of God's people. And within a local church, the, the entire congregation. 
But then he pivots, and now he begins to give attention to each individual tree, each individual follower and believer of Christ. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so here's the both and. Each one of us has a responsibility. Each one of us has to do our part to be eager to just have no stops in pursuing unity within the church. To make every effort, not a just wait and see attitude. But then ultimately, even our own ability to do that, remember the bond of peace. Where do we get that glue in the first place from? It's because we remember how God has dealt with us, has made peace with us. And that's why Paul says very accurately, Jesus gives. Jesus gives. Grace was given to each one of us. Jesus gives. And, and here Jesus giving, even the, the commentators they read, they were kind of divided, um, I know, ironically. Uh, but still on the same page overall. Um, that Are these spiritual gifts that he's giving? I mean, gifts like encouragement. Uh, service, mercy, healing, etc., etc. All those wonderful gifts of the Spirit that are listed. Or is this just in general too, even more broadly, the umbrella is just Jesus giving gifts, giving grace. And included in that are these spiritual gifts as well. I don't think it really matters uh, which way you go. And at the end of the day, that's a minor, right? That's a minor. It's not the major that Paul was talking about a verse earlier. But the point is that it's both then. We each have our part. We each have our part. But we can only do our part because of where we get the ability to extend peace, to show grace. And so Paul, he now quotes Psalm 68. And, uh, you know, I don't think it should be lost on us that this is a poem. This is, and what are poems? Poems are just uh, artfully written stories. And just the whole notion, just that we're invited to be part of God's story. As he quotes Psalm 68. And so he quotes verse 18 specifically to describe what's going on here. Therefore it says, when he, referring to Jesus, ascended on high... He led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And so Paul has this imagery from ancient times to even Paul's time and even his time of Roman Empire and so forth, when a leader, a conqueror, an emperor, whoever was victorious, they would have a train as they returned to their home city, their capital city. And that train would be full of many things, uh, which included also even captives. It was for sure a show of power, uh, just uh, puffing up the chest and to display their victory, their dominance, their strength. And so there's some of this imagery going on. But before we think too quickly, oh, so is Paul saying Jesus is just like those tyrannical leaders? No. No. When it says here, he led a host of captives. Uh, I love what Charles Hodge uh, reflects on, uh, how he reflects on this passage. And, and he says that these captives led in triumph in this way may be either the enemies of Christ, Satan, sin, and death. Uh, and death is the last enemy which will be destroyed. Or they may also be his people, but not as captives who are still actually captive, but who were once captive, redeemed by his power, subdued by his grace, and now set free. Right? It's both. And the bigger point being that Christ, he truly will be the victorious king of all kings in the end. And he is laden with spoils and able to enrich his followers to give of His grace abundantly. So this is who maintains. The point is, if we're going to pursue unity in the church, 
We need to stay connected to Jesus. We need to stay glued to God, so to speak, by his peace, and therefore glued to one another. Now all the more, I, I, I hope then that you are motivated, that, that there's just desire. Yes, I, I want to continue to overflow this and live this out. If I'm at odds with anyone, especially within the church, I'm going to make it my default attitude, my first attitude, that I have to protect this unity, to work towards it, to fight for it. Why? Because Paul continues to explain his understanding of that little bit of story, that poem in Psalm 68. And he says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended, Jesus, is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens afterward, after his death on the cross, after he descended, left his his glories and his throne, his comfort, came to earth, died on the cross for our sake, and then he ascended again to heaven and we wait for him to return, that he might fill all things, meaning to bring it to conclusion, to bring it to the story to resolution. And so what we need to remember, the the whole point of even today's gathering is lost on us if we don't leave, if if the primary uh, taste right now of what we're tasting and and the aftertaste when we leave this place, if, if the major primary aftertaste isn't Jesus. The whole point is that Jesus came down to rescue us. He came down to rescue us. And how did he do it? How, he, he gave up his body, literally, physically, but also with the deepest spiritual meaning as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity, for you and me. It can't be lost on us that the reason why we can have that bond of peace, that glue of peace, is because Jesus sacrificed his bond with the Father and the Spirit. His fellowship, His perfect unity with the Trinity so that we could be brought in. One uh, happy note in my week this past week was um, finally got connected with, uh, we just moved to a new neighborhood a, a few months ago. And I've been just hoping to connect with the neighborhood dads and uh, finally got connected with them this past week. A bunch of them uh, rallied together, and it's great to see the unity um, amongst the dads in the neighborhood, and they put their resources together, and they built a, a really, actually, it's been featured, it's featured on Toronto.ca and BlogTO, you can Google it, but it's the, I think it's the largest natural rink uh, in the city, and it's built on a baseball diamond, and now I'm part of the rotation to help maintain it and so forth, and and uh, it, was, it just made me happy to be able to connect with them and now just begin to slowly build relationships. And, but I know that with these, uh, hopefully, making new friends and with these dads, the greatest challenge, the greatest challenge is going to be to get them interested in talking about this, the, the life after this life. I know that's going to be the greatest challenge about eternal matters. As I said, I'm on the rotation for patching up the ice and so forth. And, uh, and so they will naturally care more about whether, hey, Chung, did you fill in some cracks did you, with the slush so the kids can enjoy the rink the next day? That's what they're naturally going to be interested in more. Uh, they will naturally enjoy talking about the upcoming Super Bowl and who's going to win and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's what will be natural. But what will be unnatural and and what will be the greatest challenge is to have just unrushed, uh, thoroughly engaged, interested conversations about eternal matters. Now, I say that because where does this whole notion of, of remembering Christ and what he's done, and, and even continuing to wanting to share the gospel, and, and even within the church, to continue to uh, pursue unity. Where does this 
where, where do we find that motivation? It's remembering this Jesus who ascended. So first, he was ascended, and then he descended. He gave up everything so that we could have that bond of peace. That This is what has to, we, we, we need to begin to care about most deeply. It's not natural in that sense. It's not natural to want to pursue unity per se. It's so easy to become overcome by just earthly priorities and and what we care about, what's right in front of us, what we think is more important. All that to say, I hope, I hope, I hope, I pray that this prayer could be on our hearts. Lord, make me eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Thank you.